A production fee for your hometown health connection was made by Buffalo Healthy Living Magazine and its sponsors. While October has been designated as Breast Cancer Awareness Month, it is an issue for women and men that is important to be aware of all year long. Why? Look at these stats. According to breastcancer.org, about one in eight women in the U.S. will develop invasive breast cancer over the course of their lifetime, and about 45,000 women in the U.S. are expected to die from breast cancer this year. While death rates have been steady in women under 50 since 2007, they have dropped in women over 50, thought to be the result of treatment advances and earlier detection through screening. On this edition of your Hometown Health Connection, we'll meet a hometown expert on breast cancer with information that could save your life. I am Kate Glazer. Welcome to the program. Joining us is Dr. Studi Tambar. Dr. Tambar earned both her undergraduate and doctor of medicine degrees from the University of Buffalo, where she also completed her residency in the general surgery training program. She completed her training with a specialization in treating malignant and benign breast disease from Georgetown University and focuses on screening and identifying high risk patients who will benefit from surveillance. She is a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, a member of the American Society of Breast Surgeons, a recipient of the SMBS Naughton Award for Service, and a member of the Golden Key Honor Society. Dr. Timbar has numerous publications, and when she's not at work, she loves spending time with her husband and three children, cooking and running. Wow, you are so, so busy, Dr. Timbar. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on today. Absolutely. So what is the most important thing that you want women watching to know about early detection and how and why that saves lives? So the early detection of breast cancer is uh, the most uh, common reason that we are seeing pa patients who are diagnosed with two millimeter, three millimeter cancers who need minimum small surgery and uh, quick treatments to finish their treatment plan. And uh, we are adding to the surviving women with breast cancer. Uh, late detection generally leads to higher staging, more aggressive breast cancer potentially, and needing more aggressive treatments. So we are just seeing better and better outcomes with early detection. So early detection versus late detection, what is the difference? I mean, I know that you said there's a difference in stages. How does someone know they're in early detection versus late detection? So the staging or uh, locally advanced disease as is identified usually in late stages is um, the disease has already progressed on to their lymph nodes uh, and they generally require uh, more aggressive chemotherapy, more aggressive treatment in general. But an early detected breast cancer, most women can skip chemotherapy and it will be just a surgery and follow-up treatment um, that will finish off their treatment plan and patients uh, don't need any further um, treatments. Can you talk about the importance of breast self-exams here too in its role in early detection? Self-breast exam is extremely important in that women perform it every month. Uh, we have seen so many patients who detect a lump in their breast between their screening mammograms, which is generally done once a year. Uh, women younger than 40 who don't even qualify for screening mammograms uh, find lumps on their own on self-breast exams. So it's extremely important that women know how to perform a breast exam and what to look for when they're performing it. So walk us through that. What should they be looking for? How does that actually work? And you said women under 40 should still be examining even though they're not going in for um, an actual you know, exam in office. So they should be examining themselves. Can you walk us through how that kind of works and what you should be doing? Sure, for the self breast exam, uh, the, uh, women need to know the landmarks, the boundaries of each breast, which starts all the way up from the clavicle, the, the uh, shoulder, the bone up in the chest, down to the fold of the breast, uh, from the midline and to the beginning of the armpit. Those are the four borders of a breast. And we may need to examine every inch of that area. Um, they should be watching for any changes in the skin, any nipple discharge, and make sure that any new findings like a new lump, a bump, a skin change that's not getting better despite treatment, a nipple discharge that is spontaneous as in appears on its own and women are not doing anything to express it, are, um, are notified and uh, followed up with their uh, medical professional. 
so that they can be worked up and make sure they don't have breast cancer. There's also uh, lymph node swelling in the armpit, which is extremely important. Women uh, check on and make sure that if those are found, also need to be worked up. How often should they be checking themselves? Is it once a month? Is it something where they should be concerned if something pops up and call their doctor right away? What do you recommend? Absolutely, it's uh, very important that it's checked every month and it's uh, for premenopausal women who are still having their periods, the optimal time is about a week to 10 days after they start their periods. And for postmenopausal women, uh, they can really pick any day on the calendar since there's really no hormonal surges throughout the month. If any suspicious found findings, uh, they should notify their primary care or gynecologist and make sure that it's worked up right away. Wonderful. Is there more than one type of breast cancer? There are multiple types of tissue that make up a breast, so women do have risk of developing any of those cancers. The most common breast cancer, however, is of the milk duct. About 80% um, of all breast cancer are of milk duct. And can you talk more about staging and what that means um, and what the importance of staging is? Staging of breast cancer depends on the size of the actual tumor. Um, if it, the cancer has already progressed to the lymph node or if it's progressed anywhere beyond lymph nodes like the liver or the bones. Uh, staging of more aggressive cancer uh, is um, higher for compared to their uh, not so aggressive counterpart. For example, the size to size, a tumor which is uh, highly aggressive, which be staged higher. And staging of the breast cancer uh, directly correlates to the prognosis of the patient uh, in those patients with a higher staging end up needing more aggressive treatment also like chemotherapy, extensive radiation, and uh, probably extensive surgery also. Okay, and let's talk about genetics and ethnicity as well. What role does that play in breast cancer and who and what type of groups are most at risk for this? So overall Caucasian female are at higher risk for developing breast cancer, but the research and surveys have also shown that African-American females are at higher risk of developing more aggressive cancer and presenting with a um, higher stage of breast cancer. They also have the higher risk of mortality from breast cancer. So uh, genetics does play a good role. Um, any first degree relative with breast cancer doubles a uh, woman's risk of uh, having breast cancer. So parents, siblings, children, anybody with breast cancer will significantly increase their risk. Also, um, only five to 10% of all breast cancers are actually linked to genetic mutations. 85% are actually brand new. Women do not furnish any family history in those cases. Um, the um, uh, Ashkenazi Jew have the highest risk of having breast cancer because they have the highest prevalence of BRCA mutation. So those are some of the statistics that are uh, known in breast cancer. Okay, I actually have a friend who is diagnosed with a very aggressive breast cancer. She's only 32. Um, I mm -hmm. thought that was abnormal. What is the average age of women who are diagnosed with breast cancer? The average age is 55 to about a 64 with 62 being the median age, but we are diagnosing cancer younger and younger. My younger, youngest patient at this point is 29. So we are finding these uh, women very young and um, it's surprising because these women don't even qualify for screening until the age of 40. They have no family history, nothing to indicate that they were higher risk, yet they are presenting with breast cancer. That's why self-breast exam is very important. Almost all of these women present uh, after palpating a mass a lump themselves. And the one thing that she said that I've always noted is that she didn't really think she had an issue. She felt a little bit of a lump and then she actually went in because her mom told her to. It was a small lump, so, and then she had that aggressive breast cancer. So it's so important, like you said, to have that self-exam. So, so, so important. Can you talk um, about what we are learning about different age groups and what screening should begin to get mammograms and how often women should go in for a mammogram? So the first thing extremely important is to, uh, for women to know what their risk of breast cancer. Average risk women who have uh, no personal or family history or risk factors of breast cancer should start screening at the age of 40, which should continue every year, once a year. 
for women who are high risk based on personal or family factors, they should uh, start screening as early as 25 if they have genetic mutation or 35 if they don't have genetic mutation. And they also qualify for a breast MRI annually in addition to mammogram. All right, and let's talk about um, the 2D versus 3D mammograms. Um, MRIs, ultrasounds, any other imaging methods that are used to detect breast cancer. Give us more knowledge on what you are looking into for that. So currently the most common uh, use technology for screening breast cancer is mammogram, ultrasounds. These are the screening tools we use on uh, all average risk women. Uh, women who have denser breasts, uh, can add an ultrasound because the sensitivity of mammogram is a bit lower on those patients. But uh, for postmenopausal women uh, who don't have dense breasts, just a screening mammogram is enough. Uh, 3D mammogram has become a standard at this point for, uh, for a breast exam. And it basically takes multiple shots of the breast. Imagine taking two shots of the breast in compression uh, sideways and top versus um, taking multiple shots all around the breast. So 3D has become a new standard and 2Ds are uh, basically being phased out at this point. Are there any new imaging technologies currently under development that you know of? There are a couple of uh, new technology. There's um, uh, positron emission mammography, which is basically like a PET scan uh, where a sugar-based dye is injected and um, any cancer cells are detected using a scan. This is still in the works, not really mainstream at this point, um, and, but this will be focused on just the breast. The, uh, something that's more upcoming is contrast enhanced mammogram where uh, an iodine contrast is injected uh, just prior to a standard mammogram and that enhances the breast tissue and uh, radiologists are able to identify even smaller, lightly, um, light, lightly abnormal mammograms. Many women are scared of mammograms because they, they hurt, or at least um, what I've heard, I've never had one myself because I am in that 30 age group, but talk about why women, even though it does, it may cause some pain, why it's so important, like you said, to either um, have that detection and self-screening or go in for a mammogram. So usually it's uh, not either or women should examine themselves and undergo screening mammograms every year. It's extremely important. I have had multiple myself. I'm in that 40 age group. So it's once a year, uh, a lot of women I know, they have their friends who all go together to have their mammogram and have had lunch afterwards. It's like their little annual uh, retreat. Um, so this is extremely important. It's uh, slightly painful, it is, uh, but it's not something that should be prohibitive. It's um, just a simple test. I love that you said that women should um, make this sort of an annual trip where they go with their girlfriends and they have lunch. That's so, so important because it's not just enjoyable. It gets you through that anxiety of going in for a mammogram. I love that. Thank you so much. We will return to continue the conversation on breast cancer in just a minute. Here is another stat. Breast cancer became the most common cancer globally as of 2021, accounting for 12% of all new annual cancer cases worldwide, according to the World Health Organization. We will continue the conversation in a moment. If you would like to reach out to Dr. Tambar, connect with the Great Lakes Cancer Care Collaborative online at greatlakescancercare.org and click Find a Doctor or by calling 716-884-3000. Write that information down and reach out if you need to get checked or need cancer care. We will be back in just a moment. Buffalo Healthy Living Magazine is a free, full-color magazine distributed throughout Western New York. Now, more than ever, as we all want our families and friends to be safe and well, Buffalo Healthy Living Magazine is devoted to health, fitness, and nutrition for people of all ages. It's a great read and also has great recipes. Pick up Buffalo Healthy Living Magazine all over our hometown or go online anytime at buffalohealthyliving.com. Welcome back to your hometown health connection. I am Kate Glazer. We are continuing our important conversation about breast cancer with Dr. Studi Tambar. So Dr. Tambar, how common is breast cancer? Let's talk about that. Everyone talks about it in the month of October, but how common is breast cancer? 
So breast cancer in this year, 2021, is now uh, the most common breast cancer in North America and globally. Um, one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer. And um, this year is estimated about 280,000 women will be diagnosed with invasive cancer and over 45,000 will be diagnosed with a non-invasive form of breast cancer. Um, about uh, 2,500 males will be diagnosed and um, unfortunately over 40,000 40, women are estimated to uh, not survive their diagnosis. Um, breast cancer rate is one of the highest uh, cancer rates um, uh, just after lung cancer. And uh, the upside part is it's becoming very curable, very treatable, and we have 3.8 million women at this time who are uh, breast cancer survivors. So uh, the, what we hit earlier in the segment of the early detection, uh, appropriate treatment, those are the key to adding more to those survivors. Invasive versus Vasive, correct? Invasive versus vasive. Talk about that as well and what the difference is between those, those two categories. So it's invasive versus non-invasive breast cancer. Uh, non-invasive breast cancer does not have the capability to go outside of the breast. It can locally grow and can continue to grow on, but it does not know how to travel. So the treatment for those are a little bit limited. Most women don't need chemo, um, just surgery, radiation. Uh, but the invasive cancer does have the knowledge and tendency to travel, and it will, if given enough time, travel into the lymph nodes and beyond into the bone and liver. So that's the key difference between the two. Okay, and you did talk about men getting breast cancer. That's somewhat of a misconception. Some men don't believe, or maybe some people don't believe that men can have breast cancer. So talk more about that. And I know it's a lower number, but it's still important to know about that. Yes, uh, it's very important for men to examine themselves too, because there's really no screening exam for men in terms of breast. So it's very important for men to be aware um, and examine themselves again on a monthly basis. Um, it's not common, as you said, as we discussed, only 2,500 versus 280,000 women will be, uh, dis will be diagnosed with breast cancer. But uh, I personally have treated four male breast cancer in my very short career so far. So um, it's not unknown, it's not rare, but it's certainly uh, thankfully less common, but it's very important still for men to be treated. Um, and these men who are diagnosed with breast cancer, they have 50% chance of having a genetic mutation as opposed to five to 10% of women. Okay, and what should men be looking for when they do that self-exam? For most common uh, symptom that men will present with is a lump right behind the nipple. Uh, that's where if any, all of the breast tissue is located and that's where the breast cancer is. So uh, it's very important just to be aware and if any changes happen month to month to keep an eye on it, inform their primary providers and uh, get worked up. You're so passionate. You can feel just how passionate you are for your career and saving lives here in Western New York. Can you tell us about a success story of a patient diagnosed early who is now in remission? Does anything come to mind that you could tell us about? There are just so many. Uh, thankfully, we are doing great uh, in this town in terms of early detection. Uh, we have uh, patients who are in their 60s, 70s, uh, going through annual mammograms, and uh, the, the smallest cancer was two millimeters. It was, you couldn't feel it, couldn't see it, only found on the mammogram. Took out just a small area of the breast, uh, and the patient received radiation, and they were done. Uh, they just received a, an endocrine treatment, which involves taking a pill um, every day to reduce their recurrence. Um, so it's very, it's it's a very scary diagnosis when patients first receive it uh, to know they have breast cancer. But once we get them through the information and what the treatment actually entails, I think it already starts to put them at ease that they are not they're not going to die from this. They're going to survive this. So we have to uh, keep moving along with that uh, for all patients and all population to know that ignorance and not knowing what their breast has is not going to help, but to know to empower themselves with knowledge and examine themselves, go for screening mammogram. That's what's truly is going to uh, save lives. Absolutely. Does everyone diagnosed with breast cancer need chemo or radiation? Not everybody needs chemo, uh, even radiation uh, depends on the type of cancer and the type of surgery they end up going through. 
um, more aggressive cancer, cancer that have gone into the lymph nodes do end up requiring chemotherapy. Um, and if the women have mastectomy, which is removing the entire breast, they can generally skip radiation. Um, we rarely do recommend mastectomy on specific patient, depending on the tumor size, uh, location, if there's more than one tumor in the same breast. But for the most part, uh, pretty much all women do qualify for just lumpectomy, which is removing just a small area of cancer and not the entire breast. When would a double mastectomy kind of come into play? I've heard of women going for that as well, even as a preventative. So when does that also come into play? So preventative mastectomies at this time are um, an option for women who have genetic mutation, more specifically the uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. Uh, those are the only two women who currently qualify for a prophylactic or preventative mastectomies. Uh, because th that's the only group that has shown to have benefit from removing breasts without having a cancer diagnosis. The rest of the population, um, even with high risk, uh, we don't offer preventative mastectomies. For women who have um, uh, genetic mutation, uh, those are the ones that would need it. Okay. Is there any ongoing research right now on breast cancer that you are excited about? And if so, can you talk more about that? There's so much going on in breast cancer world research uh, just because of the generous donation in every state, every country. Uh, the one that we are looking at is always de-escalation of treatment and how safe that is for women. Um, make sure that we are not uh, compromising their survival by reducing treatment. Just for by example, uh, all women uh, several decades ago would have all of their lymph nodes removed from their armpit with a diagnosis of cancer. But with research, it was shown they don't need to do that because they have a lot of side effects. We can just do remove two or three lymph nodes and make sure they don't have a lot of cancer and give them chemo. So uh, we have more de-escalation treatment currently going on in terms of do we need to give everybody chemo who have um, a certain type of cancer. There's also current uh, research going on on cryoablation, which is uh, freezing breast cancer, of course, low risk cancer in older population uh, with lower risk of recurrence. So those are some of the research that are currently heading and we're very excited. That's wonderful to hear about. Um, you said you've been in your career for a short while, but I'm sure there's been so much growth since then. And then how far has breast cancer research and surgery um, techniques advanced over the years, just to kind of give us a picture into that? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, the, even the, just a the surgical world has improved so much. We do nipple sparing mastectomy now, which is instead of removing the nipple, uh, all of the skin, we actually save the nipple and put in the implant right behind it to uh, make the breast again. So women have their own nipple, their own skin, their own breast, and instead of having the breast tissue, they have implant behind it or even their own tissue. So reconstruction uh, involves moving their own fat around to create the breast, like their fat from the back or the fat from the belly um, to make the breast. Uh, in addition, the complications of surgery have gone down so much for women who were removing, who had to remove their lymph nodes because of extensive disease. They used to have 40% risk of having lymphedema, which is swelling of the arm. But with improved techniques, that risk has now come down to what 20% if not even lower, depending on the technique. So we are making uh, strides of advances in even breast surgery alone. That's wonderful. Great Lakes Cancer Care Collaborative brings together 10 different providers and organizations to provide patients with the best possible care. Can you talk to us a bit about the advantage of being part of a collaborative of providers that work with you in addressing all types of cancer, especially breast cancer? Sure. Collaborative always provides a patient-centered care. Uh, it guarantees a cutting edge, most effective treatment that's out there. It improves convenience for the patients uh, because everything goes seamless from uh, one treatment to the next. Uh, it also provides psychosocial care, uh, like physical therapy, nutrition, counseling service, financial assistance, because uh, the resources are um, maximized by, uh, by having a collaborative in place. And it's really have been shown to improve outcomes in general. Uh, women uh, and really all population needs to 
take charge and make sure if they are getting treatment for any cancer, dis any disease site, that they are part of a collaborative um, so that they can maximize their treatment and maximize their survival. So it's extremely important that all cancer patients, all cancer are treated within a collaborative. Wonderful. Doctor, why did you decide to get into breast cancer, treating patients with breast cancer, getting into this field of work? Um, like I said, you're very passionate about it. You know so much. Why um, did you decide to make this your living and your career? Um, I came from a family where women's health wasn't a very big priority. So uh, I wanted to make it my priority. I wanted to make sure women are empowered that they are taken care of. Um, when I, I thought I might want to become a gynecologist, but the world of surgery just was just too attractive for me to give up. So when I did breast surgery um, rotations, I realized that's my passion. I love working with women. I love um, taking care of them. Breast cancer is such a curable, such a treatable disease that the outcomes are great. So that was so many reasons to go into breast surgery. Um, and it really is my passion at this time. You said the word empower, which I love. And how are you providing women empowerment and hope? I mean, really, you said that it's a very treatable disease. So how are you walking in and providing that empowerment and hope that so many Western New Yorkers need when they hear the, the phrase that you have cancer? I think knowledge is how you empower yourself. We and any patient that walks through the door, they are given uh, knowledge about their cancer specifically, not a general knowledge about cancer, but what they have and what they need to make sure they are treated appropriately and they have the best outcome. So uh, early detection, uh, high risk surveillance, genetic testing, we offer that for all of the Western New York females and males to make sure that they have the best care. And you said even your youngest patient was in her 20s and just to be able to walk in and provide her hope, how does that make you feel to be able to do that, especially for someone who is in their 20s, has their whole life ahead of them? Those are the patients that uh, definitely need the maximum support because they may need uh, fertility counseling, they may not have children and they may want to have them in the future. So have, having fertility uh, counseling, uh, getting their embryos frozen, make sure that they are taken care of in terms of treatment and even surveillance after they finish treatment and uh, really for life because these women uh, will never have a 0% risk of recurrence no matter what we do. So we, we need to keep a close eye on these women for their entire life. And they, even my patients who move around the country, I make sure that they are taken care of in the next town that they're moving uh, through the contacts and we make sure they have those connections already set before they leave. Well, thank you, Dr. Tembar, for answering these important questions about breast cancer. It was so good to learn from you and just hear more about why you're so passionate. It was a privilege to talk to you. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me on today. I am Kate Glazer. Breast cancer has impacted so many of us. Make sure you get checked if you would like to reach out to Dr. Tambar. Connect with the Great Lakes Cancer Care Collaborative online at greatlakescancercare.org and click Find a Doctor or by calling 716-884-3000. Write that information down and reach out if you need to get checked or need cancer care. Stay safe and be well. A production fee for the preceding presentation of Your Hometown Health Connection was made by Buffalo Healthy Living Magazine and its sponsors.